Okay, so we've been working in breakout rooms on a budget. Um, I also, I missed this image, you know, I didn't realize, I apologize, I didn't realize the link you had posted had this awesome image. I love this. This one's great. <laughs> That's pretty much it on a Monday morning. So at least a team exercise, you get a little help from your teammates. But this is awesome. Thank you for posting this one. I love it. All right, um, so let me just open up our budget and uh, let's hear, and for this probably easiest if you just use your microphones and you can just shout out your numbers. Um, let's actually just maybe talk about your totals. Okay, so um, what did you come up with? So team one, what did you have for a low and a high total for your project? Um, we had 141.6 for the low. Yep. And 284.4 for the high. All right. Okay, so basically exactly double. All right, thanks. Team one, what about uh, team two? What were your, what, how did your hours break down? So, Rudy and Camilo, what? Um... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't. I, I thought it was another team. Um, you can hear me, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. That uh, total. The low is a nine hundred and fifteen dollars. Okay. Oh, so you. Sorry. So you did it in terms of dollars. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. So nine thirteen. Yeah. And the high. Nine hundred and fifteen. Sorry, 913 was the low? 915, 1.5. Oh, 915 was the low. Okay, and what about the high? Yeah, 1,245. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, thank team you. three wasn't here today. How about team four? Does somebody from Team Four want to share your low and high? So Ivan, Maggie, Rebecca, Emily, what did your budget work out to be? Sorry, just one second. Okay, I'll give you another minute. We'll come back to you. What about team five? What were your ranges for the real estate site budget? So we did it in the hours. Not okay, the that's fine. So for minimal, we did uh, 100, 108. And for max, it's 171. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks. Okay, and Emily, uh, let us know what your team came up with. Yeah, so... For um for the hours it's sixty three and as a low and as a high is hundred and twelve. In terms of dollar for the low is fifteen seventy five, and for the high is twenty eight hundred. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So let's have a look. Five. So here we've got. Um, Thirty-five forty. Yeah. And here we've got. Let's see. B twenty-two. 
two times twenty five. All right, so there's our ranges. So quite big ranges. So on the low end, $900 to build this site. And then on our highest end, about $7,000 to build this site. So that's a pretty big range. Um, okay, so let's see. I would suggest if I think about what this actually cost <laughs> when I did this, um, yeah, it is. Maybe you can post it in Wall Street bets, hung. Huh? Um, this was probably the most accurate in terms of when I actually built the site like this. This was probably the right range, about 150, 160 hours. So basically sort of like two full work weeks non-stop like eight hour days five days a week sorry uh, about four work weeks so i think i charged now i charged more than 25 dollars an hour when i did this i think it charged 65 dollars an hour so the total was somewhere in the neighborhood of about seven thousand at that rate but this was probably the uh about an accurate amount of what it actually took somewhere in the neighborhood 160 hours so if you think about that, one person, again, working eight hour days, five days a week, five days a week, about a month of solid work to kind of build this from the ground up, do a design, meet with the client, get their feedback, build an admin panel for them to manage all these things, and then the front end for it all to work out. Um, I'd suggest this budget here, this, this is probably a bit low, realistically, if you think about it, could you build this all in, in two kind of two calendar weeks, start to finish and be ready to launch? Um, maybe a little bit of an underestimate here, but you know what, that's okay. We're, it's, a, it's a learning process. So um, maybe we wanna be a, li a, a little more conservative in our estimates here, give ourselves a little more time. Yeah, okay, yeah, that, that does make sense if you're looking for an API and, and plug in, that's fair. Um, I found I had to build a fair number of these things. So myself, um, which maybe I wasn't clear about, but that is that is a fair point. Um, but keep in mind, what, even when you're using APIs and plugins, it takes time to, you have to do the research, your research, right? You know, like even if it's a plugin, you're gonna have to evaluate several plugins, try to determine which one works the way you want it to, then you have to install it, test it out. And the first one you try may not work the way you like every time. So if you're gonna use a number of APIs and plugins, the chances that every single one of the first one you look at is gonna be the one you wind up using, that's maybe a bit low. So you should allocate, you know, there's gonna be some trial and error, I think, uh, in terms of that, okay? So I would hope this exercise kind of helps you come up with your budget for assignment one. So again, just a reminder in assignment one, I want every one of you to do this individually and submit your own Excel file with the hours, the low and high, and then your final budget is just gonna look like the sample I showed you last week. Um, um, I have a question. Do you want any comments with it as well? Uh, like for it, example, um, sometimes we might think something is good for, uh, for example, I'll take this example, like we were talking in terms of API and plugin, but we didn't like take into consideration that we need to test several plugins. So um, shall we like put some comments and then if something is wrong, like you can like be like, okay, this is not good. This is good. Like You know what, I mean, that's a great question. It's not at all required, but that's actually a really good idea. I wouldn't put it in the final budget like that your client sees, but in your rough draft, like your individual Excel file, absolutely you could make some notes that explains your thinking. Not a requirement at all, but absolutely you can do that for sure. Great question. So, I mean, this is still the, 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 the method that I use 20 years 
later. If I have a new project, I use Excel, I break it down into the individual features. I do a low and a high estimate in terms of hours. And then I typically go about 60% of the way rather than right in the middle an exact average in the middle. I give myself a little buffer and I go about 60 or 65% of my high. And then I simply multiply it by my hourly rate and come up with this kind of itemized budget is a simple way of doing it. And then the client knows exactly what they're paying for. And like we talked about last week, we have room to negotiate down the scope of the project if we need to by leaving things out. Um, okay. So we've talked about budgeting. I would hope that your team has what you need. I guess I should ask rather than me assuming, do you feel you have what you need in order to do the budget piece of assignment one, which is due at the start of class next week? Is there anything else you need from me in terms of being able to tackle the assignment and the budgeting for it? A simple yes or no in the chat would be awesome. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I think, yes, the example, you know what, Maggie, I will send out the example from last week. It is posted on Blackboard, but I'll share it through an announcement, the, the version we did together. Okay, I actually, um, do you have an example that we can use for the overall proposal, um, just to make sure that we're hitting all of the different points, um, such as the explanation, the bios, and all of that? Um, well, I do, but the issue is, I. The, the idea is I want your team to come up to create your own template. If I just provide one, um, if I, I don't want to provide one because then everyone's just going to use kind of the example that other students have done in the past. So part of the part of the assignment is for you guys to figure out what a good template for you looks like. Okay, so I've shown you these examples, but I don't want to actually give you the document and just have you kind of replicate it. Okay. Um, so what I want to, I want to talk a little bit more about, we talked about it last week, um, is scope creep. So I love this image which describes scope creep in projects really well. <laughs> I won't read it to you, you can read it on your own. But this is what happens all the time, <laughs> right? What clients tell us isn't necessarily what they really want <laughs> and then what our designer does doesn't always match what our developers do. And it certainly often doesn't result in what the client wants. And often, you know, we try to mitigate against this. Yeah, absolutely. And this is part of the reason why I think our program is valuable, particularly for people who are going to go on to be designers. You know, if you're only a graphic designer, but you have no training in actual programming or development, it's often hard to reconcile, you know, your design with the practicalities of being a developer. So even those of you who are here in the class, if you go on and all you ever do is design, the fact that you're learning the development skills means you're going to understand the considerations and limitations of the development team that you're working with around what's possible, what affects performance. It's not only how things look, right? But it's are they functional and do they perform well? So scope creep is a common issue and it also depends a lot on who our client is. Right, because some clients only have a really big picture, they're big picture thinkers, and their attitude is, well, I'm paying my web team to go ahead and take my vision and, and the, you know, the, the IT professionals, you figure it out. Then you have other clients 
who are micromanagers who have envisioned right down to the very last detail how they want their site to look and how they want it to function. Okay. Um, so a big challenge, and we'll talk more about this in dealing with clients, is learning what type of client are you dealing with? But this affects scope creep. So um, now you guys don't have access to Blackboard, so here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to post a bunch of links in the chat. Actually, I'll put them up on Pastebin. That's probably going to be easier. And I will put the Pastebin link in the chat. And I'll give you your instructions. Normally, this would be a breakout activity. I'm going to let you do this activity on your own. So here's what I want you to do. There's a number of articles here about ways to deal with scope creep as a web developer, okay? So I'm gonna pause the recording in a minute, give you about 10, 15 minutes, or maybe just let me know when you're done. Pick any one of these articles, I don't care which one, okay? Seven different perspectives. Pick one article, although don't not everybody just pick the first one, please. So choose any one of these articles. And the question I want you to keep in mind is, what strategy do you like the best from the article you read around managing scope creep? Okay. And so I'll give you 10, about 10 minutes or so, 10, 12 minutes, read the article, figure out what, what, what's the best idea in this article. And then we'll just come back in 10 or 15 minutes. We'll see how much time people need. And we'll just do some sharing. You can use the chat or you can use your mic and tell me what's the best idea in the article you read about how development teams manage scope group. That paste bin link did not work. Okay. No, I tried it twice and I got a 404 error saying it's not available anymore. Interesting. Okay, I will post the links right in the chat. That's very weird because it shows up for me. So I've put the links in the chat as well. So there's six articles. Pick any one of them. Have a read. Tell me what the best idea in there is. Uh, okay, so you can copy and paste. I've also put the links in the chat. So I'm going to pause the recording. I'll check back in at 1035. And love to hear what you have to say. I'm going to resume. So what I'm going to ask, maybe I'll put the, put the chat up so you can see it. Gonna make the chat window bigger. So maybe I'll just sort of start at the top and I can ask if just for a minute, if you can kind of expand a bit on your on your comment. So what did you like about this? And we can talk about it. So maybe Emily, I'll let you go first because you had the first one in the chat. So can you expand a bit? What did you like about this? Um, it's because sometimes, especially when you're new, and you want to have clients, you're like, oh, I can't say no to the client. I'll find a way to do it. But sometimes you can't because what the client is asking is just like um, difficult or it's going to break things or it's going to take more time. And you must be comfortable with saying like, no, whatever you're saying, it's not going to work. But what we can do is this, this, this and that. Right. Great, great point. And we'll talk more. We'll talk more about this. Um... We'll talk more about this later, but you know, what happens when your clients ask you to do things that you think are a terrible idea? So that's a great point. Okay, Justin, um, did you want to add anything about, about this, you know, pushing off additional features for helping manage scope? What did you like about that? Well, it just kind of helps to get the main project done and live first, and then you can worry about all the additional stuff you want to later on. Great. This helps with the timing so that people can actually see the site and use the site. Absolutely. To go live. 
Absolutely. So focusing on the, the fundamental features, really. Great suggestion. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Maggie, what about this? So you talked about communication. What, how did this really speak to you in terms of managing scope? Uh, communication is not only with your team, but it's also to, between your manager um, and also the client as um, you have to make sure the manager is aware of where you are in the project so they can communicate with the client um, as well as making sure timelines or why something might be taking a bit long if you're having added issues or added um, features into the project as well. Yeah. And this is where that that Freed Camp board really can help, right? Because you get a visual picture of where things are at any time. Um, Hung, did you wanna tell us a bit more about your comments? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so I have the same thing with uh, Mackie and uh, I just want to add something like, because uh, my article is about like, uh, there is no manager, uh, the, there's no manager on a uh, project. Okay. Progress tracking. Yep. Uh, with on their own, so uh, everybody has to come and know what they are doing. Right. Because when they don't meet the deadline, yeah, they, yeah, they great know point. That what is left. All right. Right. So really hard, really easy for things to get out of control in that scenario. And so, Young, do you want to tell us a bit more what you what you liked about this? Never implement more than you need to. Why you felt that was important. Uh, if you just imagine something more than that, you can make uh, not something weird or consequence no one wanted. So you just do what you just need. Okay, that's a really good point. Yeah, that other features, that's right. They have consequences that we may not envision. Great point. Uh, Rudia, did you want to talk a bit about your uh, what your, your point here about documenting everything, don't agree anything outside an official meeting? Yes, uh, actually, what I mean uh, is um, suppose if you're working in, in an office and you are working uh, as a team where one of your team members or even your team manager will ask you to do this or that, um, you know, without an email or any chat, uh, if there is an issue uh, with the same, they can say, no, I didn't, I didn't say that in an official meeting so that uh, it will make an internal conflict too. I have experience as well. That's why I'm saying. <laughs> You're <Yeah. laughs> absolutely right. So, yeah. so that's a great point. And this happens all the time. So what should you do if in a meeting or on a phone call, you agree to something with the client? What should you do afterwards and to formalize it? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's always good to send an email or uh, keeping keeping and you know um, meeting minutes like that. Ab absolutely, that's what you should do. So if you agree to something verbally, you should send an email so that there's a written there's a trail. You know, uh, yeah. I was having this conversation. conversation, right? Yeah. And especially, and text messaging is not a good way. So. One of our clients for the research project, we were sending text messages and eventually I said, you know what, if there's something you want, please send it to us in an email because you know the text messages eventually might get deleted. We need an email trail. So if you agree to something verbally, yeah, it should be on you to document it in a formal document or email. Yes. That's really important. Jinal, did you want to tell us a bit more about communication and paying attention to the details? Uh, yes, uh, I, th I think we should communicate well with the client, get to know everything that's in their mind and get into details about what exactly they want. Yeah, absolutely. So fleshing out those details, because that's where the scope often grows, right? If we're not clear on the details, we may think, you know, on a listings page, we're adding a photo gallery, but our client wants a video tour and... A Google map as well. So what are those details? It's important to lay those out for the scope. Uh, Justin, you mentioned signed require signed document. Why is that so important? Because then you have an actual official proof that that's what you talked about. Absolutely. Yep. And Emily, you said the same thing, right? Make sure it's signed. Um, Rebecca, you like this about tell us about future creep. <laughs> 
Yeah, I feel like it's something that you can easily kind of get a bit of a spiral in. You're thinking about what the site or the app could be, but realistically, like that line really stood with me because it's like, just work on what it actually is at the moment instead of like bogging down the code or creating, like taking more time and resources to work on something that is a possibility and not a definite. I think that's a great suggestion. And this is, again, this sort of comes back to that know your client rule. You know, when you have clients who are big picture thinkers, who are idea people and many business owners, they are, that's why they're successful because they have big ideas and it can be hard to kind of rein them in because <laughs> they always have the next great idea. And yeah. that can be tough for us as developers because it's, it's up to us ultimately to, we have to, you know, produce something that's usable. So we can, um, you know, kind of like we don't want to build like a house that's never finished. So that's a great point. And that's something to watch for in terms of identifying who your client is. Uh, Rachel, do you want to tell us a bit about why this one spoke to you about keeping it simple? Yeah, as others have said, I liked this idea of not implementing more than you need to and being proactive especially as somebody coming, you know, straight out of college, you might want to prove yourself to the client and over deliver. That's a great point. Yeah. Over pro under promise and over deliver, right? Set expectations, not too high. And then, you know, make sure you meet those expectations, That's especially true, as you said, as you know, a young, a young kind of new developer. Um, and part of the way that I kind of like to couch this to my customers is, if I sell you a project, I'm not just selling you this work for this contract, but I'm looking at, you know, a, a long term relationship is how I put it. If I do a good job, this application and your business are going to be successful and grow and you'll come back over time and bring me more work as your time and budget and needs sort of evolve. You know, the example we talked about last week, um, you know, that client, they've been my client. Um, you know, for like 15 years on and off um, because we've kept that relationship. So yeah, don't, don't do too much <laughs> at once. And Maria, you wanted to talk about the, the flexibility. This is a really important point. So yeah, the, <clears throat> sorry, about the flexibility design, uh, it's uh, great to put attention in the, even in the beginning of the development, every like feature and uh, even design and everything because uh, when you're in the final stage and clients want just to change maybe the name of the button or name of the column, that it will not be the problem uh, to really change it. So, and be open to it. Right, that's a, that's a great point. So again, you wanna sell it that your project, your, our web applications, they're almost like organisms. They're, you know, they're going to evolve. So we should design them in such a way that we expect if that application is successful and our client's happy with it, that over time there, we're going to need to update it and, and evolve it. So there's, you know, we should build with, as Maria said, flexible design and structure in place. Absolutely. And yet, Justin, for sure, we want to get sign off. So we've got agreement. Yeah, as you now you mentioned. So having contract. Um, Camilo, did you want to talk a bit about um, your comment here? about the goals. Yeah, sure. Uh, the client usually has a, a limited budget and he wants to increase the scope of the project and receive audit value for free. That's why I say, um, uh, that's why I say that it's good to establish a good proposal and establish a good communication communication from the beginning. Absolutely. So yeah, that proposal really sets the foundation, right? It sets out the terms and kind of sets the tone for that relationship. Um, so I think that's, that's really important. Um, so those are some great answers. So if you didn't have a chance to look, obviously everybody had a chance to look at at least one article. So those links, you know, it's a good idea. Keep those as a reference because scope creep is a real challenge um, for all of us. But these are some ways that we can at least try to manage and mitigate it. 
I'm going to come back to one other thing, actually, Emily mentioned in the first comment. So not being afraid to say no, and we'll talk more about that later. The other approach I often take is not, rather than saying no, I will typically say yes to most requests. Um, but what I do is I'll say yes, but this is how much extra time I need and this is how much more money it's going to cost. <laughs> so yes, if you want more work done, I can do it, <laughs> but I can't do it within the original budget and original timelines set out in the project. So if you're willing to give me more time and you're willing to give me more money, yeah, we can do more. But keeping in mind, I think as particularly as Rachel and Rebecca said, you know, there has to be a limit to this. And I think Justin mentioned it well. Ultimately, we want to keep our clients focused on what are the fundamentals? What are the main things you really need to get this site launched and up and running? And we can always look at what else you want to do with it later. Right? We don't want to build this forever. We want to launch it. We want to get paid. We want you to be successful and we want to move on and do other things. Right? We don't want to build and build applications forever that no, never get launched and no one ever uses. Um, so these are great suggestions. What I'm going to do actually, I'm going to take all of your suggestions here and hopefully Blackboard will be back soon. <laughs> So I'm actually going to add all of your comments into the item on Blackboard so that um, we got, we'll have it. So in the Lesson 3 folder that you can see, I'm sure you'll get access soon. So I have this item here under Scope Creep with the links that you can refer to. And I'm just going to paste in everybody's notes. so that you've got them. So these will be things to keep in mind as you're working in the future on projects. You know, how do we battle this? Because it, it really is a common challenge in every project. How do we keep it from getting too big and from the project kind of getting away from us? Um, okay, it's 10.45. Um, so I think we're we're, we pretty much covered what we wanted to cover for today. So just a quick checklist for next week. So make sure your assignment one is submitted and you have until next Monday at 9 a.m. So submit it by the start of class, please. So your PDF version of your proposal, your individual budget worksheets in Excel, and um, you just submit all those together as well as your member contributions document. And please make sure you've invited me to your Freedcamp site and that every, you are logging all of your time. So that's for next Monday. Um, we've done the in-class budget exercise. You guys have participated in the scope creep discussion. Uh, we didn't get to this today. That's okay. We'll, we'll look at project methodologies next week. Um, and I will give you assignment two. You'll have two more weeks for that. And again, make sure you're logging all of your time. Okay, uh, any comments or questions from anybody before we Yep, just one submission per team, Maggie. Yes. Great question. And you can just upload the indiv all the individual files um, along in that one submission. Yes, Emily, happy to uh, have a chat. Okay, everybody. Um, thanks for sticking with me on this cold, sunny Monday. <laughs> Hope the caffeine's kicking in for you. Hope your class at noon is good. I will see most of you on Thursday. And for those of you who are not in the Thursday class, I'll see you next Monday. Hope your week is great. If you have questions with the assignment, please let me know.